But uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I want to head back to the golf because before we talk about David's retirement this afternoon, uh, we need to just wrap up that scoreboard, David Morrow and Jim Maxwell, uh, especially for our listeners who are joining us uh, after the A-League. And what a performance again to uh, Jordan Spieth of Texas. Amazing performance. A course record 63. He birdied 3, 5, 6, 7, 14, 15, 17 and 18. So four birdies on the way out, four birdies on the way home. It's as symmetrical as you can get. Didn't uh, He didn't have a bogey at all in this uh, incredible round. He, he even described himself as his best round of golf ever. It was a stunning performance. Rod Pampling finished six shots behind. He finished at seven under and he shot a three under 68 today. And I would have thought that when he hit off, Pampling probably thought, well, if I shoot a 68 today, I'll be in the hunt. Well, he was six shots off the hunt. Brett Rubford finished at six under par. He finished third with a one under 70 today. Greg Chalmers at five under. He started the tournament after two rounds at five under. He finished at five under. He had three par rounds, did uh, Greg Chalmers, punctuated by that five under 66 on the second day on Friday. Adam Scott slipped back to fifth. He finished all square with the card today to finish at four under the card. He had a bogey at four and a double bogey at five. and That was basically the end of the penny section as far as uh, his chances of winning were concerned. Jake Higginbottom, he finished at three under the card to finish sixth. Robert Allenby and Ryan Fox, they finished one under the card after both of them birdied the last. And Daniel Nisbet, this young man who just made the cut, and I mean just, he was the last man into the field for the last two days, and he hit off at 25 to 8 yesterday morning. He shot a 67. He rounded that off with a fine par round of 71 today to finish at ninth. So uh, they're the only players that finished par or better. And uh, I think, uh, Jim, you might uh, dash off and see whether... Well, we'll wait for a while. We'll be able to get him shortly, won't we? Moment. Hopefully. But uh, what a round. You spent most of that back nine watching this man, this incredible round unfold. And 63, and, and no one got near that today. I'll ask him how many putts. I reckon it's about 21 putts. Uh, it was a stunning performance of uh, high-quality precision golf around the greens, which uh, have proved to be the master of quite a few players in the last four days on this course because of the firmness of the greens, the undulations and the difficulty in, in judging the line of some of the putts. But uh, for Spieth, uh, his putting was just extraordinary. And when good players putt like that, they normally win, particularly if there's no one who can keep up with them. So it was thrilling to see an exceptional young talent play as well as, uh, as he has here today but I, th I think even he may be a bit surprised at the 8 under 63 just getting applause here in the media centre as he lines up for a chat with everybody and I might go over and join them in a moment David as we, uh, yeah, we wrap up the show it's not as if it was a bad field. I mean, Adam Scott was in the field. I know he's met to number three in the world. Rory McIlroy was in the field. He's the world number one. You've got experienced players like Rod Pampling, Brett Rumford, Greg Chalmers, Robert Allenby. I mean, just to name a few that know, know their way around a golf course. And today, he was. Uh, I thought it was a stunning performance from, uh, from Jordan Spieth. And I think there have even been suggestions from some of those... Uh, who've, uh, who've watched a lot of Australian Opens who think it might well be as good a round of golf as, it, as we've ever seen in an Australian Open. Certainly, you'd think that would have to, you'd have to find something more stunning in the final round uh, than Jordan Spieth uh, to beat that. That was just a, a remarkable round of golf. Uh, Adam Scott, as I said, he did himself uh, no, no... Well, he basically did his chances in the middle of the front nine with that bogey and then the double bogey on five. He, he also bogeyed 13 and 16 and had birdies at 2, 6, 14 and 18, but uh, that was enough for him to, to finish up scraping together a, a par round today, but it wasn't enough in the end uh, to uh, to prevent the, the hemorrhaging that had happened on the front nine. And he was a long way behind Jordan Speet all day. He was always chasing the lead, and uh, it was left to Pampling and Rumford and Chalmers to offer any sort of resistance or to try and do some chasing, but even they couldn't. Uh, they were just no match for this young American. Pampling actually birdied the last three holes. Uh, but uh, the, they'll, they'll get some solace out of it, Pampling, Rumford and Chalmers. Before the money that jumps into the into the piggy bank, they also 
automatically qualify for next year's Open Championship, the British Open Championship, that is, to be held at St Andrews. So uh, that's another bonus that you get with the Australian Open now. The top three players who haven't already qualified, people like Jordan Spieth, Adam Scott, Rory McIlroy, just to name a few, had already qualified for next year's Open. So the top three in the field outside of, uh, I think there were six that had actually qualified prior to the tournament who were in the tournament, uh, they just automatically, it's, it's just a real bonus and, and something to, uh, that um, they'll cherish. Uh, great to see uh, uh, the leading amateur, Lucas Herbert. Uh, he had a tremendous uh, four rounds, except for the last couple of holes at the Masters. And don't forget, he was in contention at the Masters until well into that second nine on the last day. He was still in contention to win it, but then just fell away in the last couple of holes. But uh, a th- three over for the tournament here at 69 today, and he was the leading amateur for the tournament. And as I said, Rory McIlroy is 72 today to finish two over for the tournament after his disastrous 76 yesterday. He just couldn't match it. And in the end, it's hard to believe that the world number one was 15 shots behind the winner when, when the judge called a halt. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll go a long way, Karen, to see a better round of golf than that. Jordan Speak today just dominated, and hopefully we, we might get some words from him. Jim's going to try and chase him in there. Uh, eight under 63. Quite, quite an astonishing round of golf. And deservingly, uh, he'll get his name engraved into the Stonehaven Cup, along with the likes of Player and Nicholas and Norman and Thompson and Witten and Von Nida. You go through that incredible list of great golfers, Devlin, you know, the, the, all the greats, Graham. All the greats have won it. Uh, and now we've got another one, uh, Jordan Spieth. And as we were saying just before the news, thanks to one of our listeners that had contacted you, that, that synergy of the course record 63 63 not out, uh, Philip Hughes. You talk about those great names on the Stonehaven Trophy, David, and we were talking yesterday, weren't we, with Jim about the, the generation and really once in a lifetime collection of commentators, sports broadcasters, all from our Sydney Grandstand office. Well, it wasn't known as Grandstand then, but ABC Radio Sport. And you are very much a big part of that. McGilvray, May, Maxwell, Marks. Marnie, McGowan, Morrow. You know, I just want to read you a few of these texts that are coming through, and I can't read them all, but I wanted to start with this one, John, who says, David, I remember when you were an auditor when I worked at Blaney Abattoir nearly 40 years ago. (laughs) Great career change. Best footy commentator. What were you like as an auditor? Certainly not. A, it's not as such a popular profession as being a sports broadcaster. I reckon those that knew me as an auditor are very happy I finished up being a sports commentator. <laughs> and, uh, now they were fun days. We used to love going down to Blaney and Molong and Orange and Wellington and Dubbo. I used to go out to Cobar, actually, to do some auditing. Narromine, we'd uh, Mudgy. We'd, uh, we'd, we did most of the, the Central West from Alan Mawson Company in Bathurst. We had all, yeah, it was, uh, it was a... It was different, but uh, certainly a lot different to what I did for most of my life. That was for, that was sure. But yeah, you know, I still go back and run into a lot of those those fellows that were working in all the councils in those days, and I run into quite a few of them at the cricket when they come to Sydney. And uh, they are they were good memories, and uh, I still get back to Bathurst a bit and see some of the fellows that uh, that I used to hang around with a bit in those days. And I think they all say the best thing that ever happened to probably the best thing that ever happened to Bathurst. The best thing that ever happened to me was come to Sydney and become a sports commentator. <laughs> and all the best. Here's a great story to David Morrow. I grew up with David's commentary. My brothers and I would watch the ABC Big Game in the early 1980s on a Saturday afternoon at 3pm. Remember that, David, Saturday afternoon, expertly commentated by David. We would get so boisterous that we would then go out into the front yard with a footy and rip into each other, usually with the game ending in tears for one of us. No one could build excitement or a better visual picture of exactly what was happening in the game. Truly brilliant. Cecil from Maroochydore on behalf of me and my brothers. Huh, thanks. I love Marucci Door too. I get up there fairly often. It's a beautiful part of the world. And every time you go there, you think, why well, isn't there a rugby league team uh, in the NRL based on the Sunshine Coast? It's just every time you go there, the, the place has just grown and grown and grown. And I think at some stage that they're going to have to do something about another team, certainly either in northern Brisbane or in western Brisbane, that those two corridors... I think are desperately hanging out for another team, and uh, I'm just not sure when we can, when the game can afford it. But yeah, it's, a, it's there's too many people up there that love the game that probably deserve to have their own team. And from David, David, the last ball is about to be bowled. 
Thanks for many years of great, accurate, unbiased, extremely entertaining calling. I wish you happiness and success for any future endeavour and I hope I find you calling Rugby League again. David, I know on grand final day, what a grand final it turned out to be for South Sydney. We'll, we'll play a little snippet of that um, in a little while. Uh, there was quite a tribute to you featuring many voices and many of your, your Rugby League moments. Um, is there a highlight for you before? And we've, we've got quite a few other moments and because you covered so many sports and your passion for Olympics and athletics in particular, I, I just want to bring a few more of those moments to our listeners. But in terms of your winter passion, rugby league, can, can you grab a highlight there? <laughs> ah, look, I said to someone the other day, yeah, I think I was talking to Andrew Webster, who uh, follows the St George Dragons, the Illawarra Dragons, and... Um, I said, mate, calling the grand final in 2010 and when they won, I said, finally the monkey was off the bank, the back. Because I started in this game in 1980 and uh, Dragons had won the premiership in 79 and they hadn't won one. And I thought, I must be the jinx. So, yeah, that, that obviously is something. South winning this year was something extraordinarily special because uh, my mum was a South supporter and the, last, the, the first day I ever broadcast a word as, as an employee on a radio station, was actually grand final day 1971 when uh, Paul O'Connell, who still works at the ABC and News Radio, actually introduced me to the world of, uh, of radio back in uh, Kempsey, on 2KM in Kempsey, and on grand final day 71. So uh, there was a, a special moment there when South Sydney won the comp at long last after such a long period of time. Uh, our, Bernie Walsh is here <laughs> jumping up and down because Bernie's a, he's, he's got, he's got, he's almost got rabbit ears. <laughs> but he's, he's a rabbit through and through. Oh, obviously, there are, look, you get, you get such a privilege. I, I said this to a few people the other day as well that Roy Simmons came to work for us for a while when Roy had, uh, retired from coaching, uh, in one of those periods when he wasn't coaching. He, he came to work for us for a while. And I remember one day he was sitting in the broadcast box and I just remember him saying, he said, is this the best game in the world? He said, it doesn't cost you anything to get in. You get the best seat in the house. He said, and what's even better, you get paid to do it. <laughs> and that was that really, you know, it was, it was typical of Royce's humour, but it, it does bring it home. It's a privilege to what Jim and I have had the privilege to do for so many years is to, uh, to actually get paid to watch sport. And, uh, and hopefully we've, uh, we've covered to, to an extent that people have enjoyed it. Well, let's just hear the last couple of minutes of that amazing grand final, your last, 2014. <laughs> Played across the halfway, the ball comes away. Then we'll wait to Keary. Keary sprints through. Keary gets Boy. the pass away. Surely that was forward to Inglis. Inglis is racing away. Inglis scores. What are they going to do? They've looked forward, but it was a lovely break from Keary and a lovely finish from Inglis. His second first of the game, and at 30 points to six, kick the count. South Sydney score another try through Greg Inglis. It's 30 points to six. Here comes Sam Burgess. The kick looks fantastic. No! It looks good off the boot, but then it just missed on the near post. South Sydney 30. Canterbury makes town 6. South Sydney win the Premiership. The first time since 1971. Yeah, you can cheer along. Where's Bernie? Sitting in front of us. Sing the song, Bernie. Come on. Go on, Phil. Let us hear it. David, yesterday, you know we were talking about that you just can't manufacture love for something or manufacture passion. That was just out of the box, wasn't it? Just the sheer emotion and the story of that whole grand final and, and the way the crowd reacted at the end. Yeah, and a little bloke that loves South is with me now. Hey, that was a special day, Bertie. It was a special day, David. It was excellent. Karen, I'd just like to say a word of thanks to David uh, on behalf of David's uh, technical support crew, which is usually only one of us at a time. Uh, from Bruce Jackson, Len Kurnos, Dave Winter, Scott White, Lon Minogue, Philip Orman, Tom Kazaz, Louis Mitchell, Paul Conroy, and more recently Wayne Davis, David Case and Joshua Craig. 
plus all the other techs in all the other states that have worked with you, David, and all the ones I've forgotten to mention. We would like to thank you for your professionalism and your integrity, for your calmness in the face of technical meltdowns, which has been a few, <laughs> but especially for your friendship, which will never be taken away from us. Thanks, David. Thanks, man. Yeah, that was... We've had some great times, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's not over yet. I'll, uh, I'll still get to a lot of sporting events, I hope, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's been a passion of mine, and I've really enjoyed every moment of it. Of course you will. I'll tap you on the glass. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Bernie. And I know Martin was another texter to just send you all the best from all the Brisbane studio team and saying he's a fellow Arsenal supporter, which I wanted to ask oh, you, Martin who do, Finber. Yeah, who yeah, do we'll you see, love that's... most, Arsenal or St George, or can they not be separated? Oh, look, you, know, you, you, you grow up with the sport you love. I mean, uh, I... Uh, People often wonder, why, why, how did I ever become a St George supporter? Well, my grandparents lived in Hurstville. So when I came to Sydney, I, I always stayed at Hurstville. Um, well, I spent a lot of time there. And uh, my father actually ran for Hurst, for uh, St George in, when he was a runner and actually played rugby for St George. So, I mean, it, it just, even though I came from the bush and people said, oh, it wasn't because St George were on top. I said, well, I don't know. But I said, I spent a lot of time at Hurstville Oval and places like that when I was a kid when I came to Sydney. So it was natural that I, I followed St George and, you know, that... That's sort of, I think, the, yeah, you, you know, your first passion's your most. I always get really upset, Karen, when someone says, oh, I don't follow a team. And I said, well, how do you follow the sport? I mean, the thing about team sport is that I think the only way you get to love a team sport, I can understand Warren Ryan's, where Warren Ryan comes from. He's coached, coached nearly every team. He's played for a few teams. I mean, Warren says, well, you know, he said, I've had a, had a reason to love every team I've been at. So it's very hard for someone like Warren, and I can imagine how he feels, and what a great man he's been to me. Gee, he's been, you just learn something every day when you're with Warren. And I just think, you know, your, your, your passion for team sports start with supporting a team. So, yeah, and I, I think it goes from there. And see, I'll tell you what, if you, if you try and follow a team sport and say you don't follow one, I mean, I Always, yeah, Drew Morford, I mean, Drew was always asked which AFL team he follows. He said, I don't. But he said, I follow St George. Because <laughs> he grew up in the Cronulla area before Cronulla came into the comp. So, you know, you've got to have a passion for, I think, for team sport. And I think anyone who says that they follow a team sport but don't follow someone, um, you know, I think that some stories that there's probably an inkling somewhere on the line that the team, the team you grew up with as a kid and as a teenager, I'm certain, is the team that you probably think the most of all your life. You just mentioned another M there from the grandstand department, oh, yeah. Drew Morford. And, um, and, Doug, and yeah. Dick, Dick and Doug Mason were down there then too. <laughs> yeah, that's, there you go. Um, wow, that, that's going back some, some time. But before the news, we were also talking, look, I, I don't know how many Olympics. It was 1984 when we just played Dean Luke in, in the weightlifting? Yeah. Was that your first games? Yeah. So all those years later in London 2012, and you were reflecting on that incredible night for the Australian team that the double goal Old, and Sally Pearson, you were there behind the microphone for the athletics and Anna Mears and the journey of hers culminating with gold in the sprint at the velodrome. So uh, why don't you just uh, sit back and, and we'll bring you that, that double gold from the two M's, Morrow and Morfitt. They're both looking at the scoreboard. There's nothing in 12.35. They've given it to Pearson, an Olympic record. Sally Pearson has won the gold in 12.35 seconds. She jumps for joy. She hits the track. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it is absolutely incredible. It's just like it went so fast. Pearson flew out of the block, so did Wells and Harper and Pearson's in front as they come to the phone. And Pearson clears out from Harper and Wells. Pearson is well clear. She's only got a couple to go. Pearson and whoever. Pearson and Harper. Go to the line, Pearson. Pearson, I think, beaten Harper. It's a dipping finish, but I think that Sally Pearson's got there and got there by the narrowest possible margin. There's nothing in this. I said Pearson to my people, I want this. It has to be mine. It can't go any other way. It has to be mine tonight. And Oh, man, that was awesome. It was just... I was so nervous and so scared for it, but I was so ready. I just, I just really wanted that, and I wasn't going to let anything stop me. Peerless Pearson has provided perfection by taking the gold medal by two one hundredths of a second from Dawn Harper of the United States of America. What a run. Great performance. Dawn Harper is celebrating the silver, but also generously applauding, applauding Pearson's wonderful run, an Olympic record. 
one of the fastest in the history of hurdling. And Pearson and Harper know the feeling together now. They both won Olympic gold. Now Mears rolls away on the inside, so she must lead at the start. Hearts would be thumping. Gee, my heart's thumping up here because Anna could be just this one ride away from being an Olympic champion for the second time. Mears hooks to the top of the track and pretty much brings the race to a standstill. Close to the rail, right up against the fence, and Pendleton's right behind her. She might even try to come to a standstill completely. She just about did, and Pendleton rolled away to take a bit of an advantage. And she has skipped about six bike lengths away, but it's a long, long way from home. Mears tails her up. She's now within about three bike lengths, high on the track. There's a lap and a quarter. Pendleton leads. Mears has her in her sights. They get the bell. It's all on the line over the last 250 metres. Pendleton looking over her right shoulder. Mears stares straight ahead and goes straight up to Pendleton and goes past her. Vicky's gone. Anna's going round the final bend. Mears comes to the line. Gold medal, Anna Mears. Magnificent. And she threw off the visor that fell off yesterday in celebration and Pendleton does congratulate Anna Mears and Anna is punching the air gold medal to Anna Mears and Anna throws a helmet in the air it's gone 20 feet in the air and with the cleats and everything she's walking up the steep painting you see an opportunity and you take it and you've got to commit and I gritted my teeth and I, I you couldn't hear it because the crowd was so loud but I was yelling under my breath I go <laughs> and I went, and I just caught. I can't believe it. Hugged and kisses over the over the fence for Anna. Phenomenal. It was. Oh, David, wh when did you end up seeing Drew after that night? I, did I have them in the right order there? Was it Sally first no, Anna, and Anna, Anna, Anna won, first? No, Anna won first, yeah. I was actually picking up the fields for the night, um, which you go in and get your starting lists and things like that, and... Uh, it was on the television, and uh, I think I was the only Australian. I may not have been. I think Peter Mears might have been there, but I may be wrong. I think Mears, he was standing alongside me, and we were cheering, and the rest of the room was silent when Anna hit the line, and we looked around and said, hmm, they'll get silenced again later tonight when, when Pearson wins, because uh, it had been a bit of animosity in the papers over there, you know, that this we've got to beat the Australian syndrome, and, you know, I'd, I didn't like it. I thought, you know, I don't think we've ever said we've got to beat the English to the extent that it was in the English papers. And anyway, it was it was a wonderful night. And yeah, you know, I did catch up with Drew about I don't know because it was raining. I remember it was raining, and I trying to get out of the rain. Then we got uh, we finally got back to where we were staying, and where we normally had dinner was closed, so we had to go around the corner. But Drew was there, and Drew's lovely wife Kaz was over there. She'd probably been off watching horses everywhere. She's such a love of the horse. I mean, she's a brilliant horsewoman herself. And, I mean, we just went out and had a, a nice dinner and a few others rocked up as well. And I actually... But actually, when I went through customs in London, I got a bit uh, ahead of myself. I bought a couple of bottles of champagne, decent stuff, because I said, we'll open this when Sally wins. So we did. And, uh, you know, it was something uh, I'll remember. As, uh, yeah, that's the best moment of my life. Broadcasting life. Yeah, David, you know, I, I only just thought about th there's a lot of changes happening at, at the moment. But, you know, how privileged I, I've been to two Olympics and you've been to, to, to so many more The the others I've been back in the studio. That's what great technology can make it easier to uh, be broadcasting from back home in a linking capacity. But, you know, like whether it's television or radio, how privileged uh, we've we've all been to be one of many sort of few people to to be able to sit there calling the athletics or sit there calling the rugby league uh, for fans around the country or sit there to call the, the test cricket um, as you've been involved in cricket and, and Jim for so many years and, and others. Uh, but the ability for you to paint the picture with your words, your quality of voice and your energy and your true passion uh, will always stay with me. And um, Jen, Jen has just texted through to say... I literally cried hearing Kerry O'Keefe's last call earlier in the year. I was equally disappointed when Warren Ryan retired. But now I'm driving home, doing my favourite thing to do on a Sunday, listening to ABC Grandstand on the radio in the car, crying again, hearing David Morrow's final show. 
As a Bathurst girl born and bred, now in Port Stephens, and as a fellow Dragon supporter for life, <laughs> I'm going to miss hearing David Morrow on the radio enormously. It'll be a long time in sport before we have another voice and passion for sport like his. Congratulations on a marvellous career. Thank you for so many wonderful memories over the years. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, look, we don't, we, as I said earlier, we, we're so privileged to go to these things. And uh, Peter Hadfield, you heard Peter's voice there when we were talking when uh, Sally won. And I mean, I don't know, she, Pete, Pete and I called the World Cup of Athletics. I think our first broadcast together was in 1985 in Canberra. And on that day, uh, Marita Cock broke the world record for the women's 400 metres at uh, at 47.60, that record still stands today. And it was only at the London Olympics, another record that was set that day, the women's 4 by 100. Uh, the East Germans set that that day, and it was broken by the Jamaicans in London at the London Olympics. And uh, Peter and I, I don't know how many games we went to together and how many athletics events, and Pete and I called a lot of things you know, that people wouldn't even know about. We did things at you know, club level and inter-club and Australian championships when... The Telstra lines weren't in and things like that, but uh, you know it was it was fabulous. It's a, as I said, it's 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 a privilege and it's it's such a, a thrill to get that right. And I'm, I'm certain, and Jim knows what I mean. You you go to these things and you know you know it's just it's just something exciting. And you know, Karen, I mean, you know, you, you live with a man who's been to so many uh, so many of these sporting events. And I know Glenn just thinks that you, when you walk into some of these things, that you think, gee, how lucky am I? And uh, I still feel the same when. I've often said, when I walk into the Sydney Cricket Ground, I feel that I'm going to something special, even if it's a press conference, or even if it's... You know, well, I did go to something special earlier this year in March, Jim Maxwell's second second wedding. That was one of the <laughs> fantastic days that I've ever had in my yeah. life. It was just yeah. a special moment. But, I mean... That was a sporting event. <laughs> well, I don't know whether Jen called it a sporting event, but we did say one thing that day to Jen. I said, October the 5th, darling, October the 5th. And, of course, that was grand final day, so she got another wish this year as well. Yes. Uh, I've just come back from the, the press conference. Sorry, I, I missed some of this, uh, Karen, but um, we, we couldn't get a one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, certainly um, a very gracious and impressive young man, Jordan Spieth. And uh, he said that he would have been happy to have two or three under today. And he said, yeah, three under, that would have won. <laughs> so he had no expectation of doing what, what he's done. But he did feel as though coming into the uh, the tournament out of where he was playing in the States, he was in the zone this week, and he certainly was. So um, we'll try and get some audio out of it all a little bit later on. But as we're rolling on towards the close of play uh, today, Karen, um, I would uh, just like to say that, uh, you know, the 30 years of working with uh, David, we've been uh, blessed to have someone who's not only very knowledgeable, but can put the message over in such a way that everybody knows what's going on. I don't think there's been a more accurate describer of action either in a game of rugby league, football, which he's done some of. And I, I wonder how much of that accuracy comes from having been a race caller where you live by your mistakes, David, basically, don't you? Oh, yeah. That's what you're judged on. You're expected to get it right all the time. You make a... Make a Yes, someone once said to me, it might have been Jeff, Jeff Marnie, what a great man. Um, he said, you know what, David? He said, you can call a thousand photo finishes right, but they'll only ever remember the one you got wrong. Mm. <laughs> so well, true. Ken Howard, too. Yeah, That's yeah. what happened with him. Yeah, well, it was, that was this late 50s syndrome, Sim, that, uh, Jim, that we are talking about earlier, that race callers seemed to, to lose the edge. That was a, a common thread amongst race callers when they lost that edge. Was uh, in the mm, late 50s. Even Joe, Joe Brown. Joe Brown, there's a lot of them. That yes. Just, yeah, go through a lot of them. And, that's why I really admired the likes of Ian Craig and John Russell was still calling races in, 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 you know, in, in Melbourne, I think, well into his 70s. I mean, it was mm. an amazing performance that he could do it so accurately and so well. Well, you're only just into your, your 60s without giving too much information yeah. away to everybody and you're still calling a rugby league as accurately as anyone, better than anyone else in the country, in my, my view. So... Um, this is a it's a big loss to the, the ABC to lose your quality and credibility in this way, uh, and uh, hopefully you get some opportunities somewhere else, wherever it may be, to continue this distinguished career. Although it's ending at the ABC, uh, it's been an ex extraordinary. 
period of your life, hasn't it? Because you were there and then went off to Channel 10 for a while. You did uh, some 14 TV months. Rugby I could, I think 14, 14 months. 14 months yeah. less one day, I could tell you that. Yeah, I'd love to tell you really. But break. it's the all, all round accomplishment. That's the thing. You, you know, listen, listening to you on the track and field, every, everything you've done has, has been done with a, a real sense of passion about what you're doing, knowledge of it. And as I say, accuracy. It's very hard to be accurate all the time when you're a sports broadcaster, but uh, you've brought that to your trade, and uh, well done for that and for your uh, wonderful friendship in many ways around this and other things that we do in life. It's been memorable, memorable, and I'm sure it'll kick on in, in some capacity. Oh, it'll Bernie, Bernie, Bernie you and I'll going, kick going on. to say a word he or did. two. Yeah, we've got Bernie yeah, Walsh Bernie's on been on? Yeah, Bernie's okay. been on. It's, uh, it's great Excellent. that he's here because... Uh, Excellent. And, and uh, you know, it's just pity Warren's not here. That was all. It'd be lovely to have Warren ride here today. He's not far away. No, he isn't far away. <laughs> <laughs> Pageman Hotel's not far from here, is it? But, but yes. Uh, anyway, it's. Uh, we, we're, we're not going to well up too much. We, no. we, we've <laughs> shed too many tears this week. Yeah. yeah. It, we, we, but, it's a funny. Warren and I built up a relationship. Was it's just amazing. We were like a hand in glove. It was. Uh, Warren knew when to come in, and I knew. You know, it was, it was just a. Amazing way we call football together. It was, uh, and you know, you get used to it. But you know, it takes a while to get used to a new, a new expert. And uh, some people need to realise that you don't just sit down with an expert and it happens straight away. But, uh, that's not the way. Uh, that's not the way some people see it. Sadly, which is uh, which is not not the way that uh, I recommend that young broadcasters and and experts I should try and call in teams because I'm certain that you have a greater rapport when you call in teams. Yes, and the message. Yes, we need to get back to that. I agree. Uh, it's, uh, it's something. I miss calling the cricket, Jim. I mean, I've, I've always loved my cricket, as you know. We, mm. It's a passion cricket. And uh, I'll, uh, we're going to... Uh, it's That's something that... The greatest thing about cricket is there's, there's so much time when there's nothing happening, so it seems. Uh, well, that's what, <laughs> but there's but lots, there's lots to talk about. That's what you're so good at. You, know, <laughs> you, you can switch a topic and all of a sudden people are glued to the radio again. Well, and it's, it's a bit like that out in the golf course at times, I've got to say. Yeah, it was good, good to cross see today. I thought, this is good. Jim's out there. He can, he can fill in the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> David, I tell you what, we finished in the nick of time. It's pouring with rain. Oh, look, well, it, it was meant to be, wasn't it? It was meant to be that final round of 63. As 63. Talked about. Isn't like that a number? Yeah, it is. Oh. And, 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 you know, look, I just want to read a, a couple more of these texts. So many are yes. coming through. And I've, I've, I've got some more little bits of audio because I just want to just keep moving through this. Before, before we know it, there will be time for the news. Uh, from Mac David. In my humble opinion, you and was a rhyme with the best league commentary team ever. The commercial mob were never in the race. Good luck in whatever you do next. And in terms of just echoing Jim and with the accuracy and painting the picture, as a blind rugby league lover, no team ever brought the game to life like Thirsty and Wok. Anyone can describe play and a lot can communicate excitement, but very few can do both to such a degree. People don't believe I'm vision impaired because I gain so much from your call, David, or the very best in retirement. That's Chris from Toowoomba. And uh, the David Morrow car alarm by Humor Australia about a decade ago <laughs> springs to mind whenever I hear David get excited. I've enjoyed his commentary immensely. And the Newtown Jets University of Rugby League is a night I will never forget. That is Justin in Earlwood. That uh, was... Uh, yeah? That is... That, it's, Andrew Webster asked me my most special Warren Ryan moment and I had to think for a moment but that is the, that is the night that night that uh, we had Peter Shamarasil I think we had it uh, we had a, a 30 year anniversary of Newtown playing in the grand final and they called it the University of Rugby League uh, Warren Ryan Phil Gould and Kenny Wilson and uh, uh, people that were there said you know we could have gone to well we did go to well into the morning but it was just one of those nights it started with you know it was very tiptoey and then Phil Gould told the story about the uh, Newtown Manly brawl in the 81 final series and from there it was just one of the most fascinating evenings there was seriousness punctuated by an enormous amount of humour mm. uh, that, was, that was a really special night yeah. David just before we were talking about Olympic Games experience and, and just how amazing London was on that night Sally Pearson and Anna Pears London produced many moments and earlier in the program we replayed Beijing and the Incredible Usain Bolt, uh, who followed it up in London. You were there again, and it was definitely a case of history repeating itself. 
worries about There's something evolving Wherever may come The world keeps revolving They say the next big thing is here Sit That the Blake was slow in the stride, Gatlin got away quickly, Bolt started to come through quickly, Gatlin and Bolt, now Bolt starts to put on the accelerator, Bolt is storming away from him, Bolt goes through, Blake's got second, 9.64 seconds, it's a new Olympic record, but it's not a world record, but Usain Bolt has won it comfortably, Blake's got second, and a photo, I think, between Gatlin and Gay for the bronze medal, is he, is he right, is he the best, is he the greatest, He's a legend, 9.63, rounded down, four hundredths outside his own world record. He is the Muhammad Ali of 100 metre running. He is the greatest. Then it's all just a little bit of history repeating. I executed and that was the key. I stopped worrying about the start and I executed, so it worked. People can talk, all they can do is talk. I tell you people that... When it comes to the championships, it's all about business for me, and I brought it. The newspaper shout, a new style is growing, but it don't know if it's coming yeah. or going. Bolt was quickly in the stride, and so too was Weir, and Blake is running a very fast first 200. Bolt comes off the bend, he's in front, Blake is starting to give chase, Bolt's clear, here comes Blake out after Bolt, it's Bolt and Blake, Bolt leads by half a metre, Blake's getting closer to him, Bolt's going to win it, Bolt's going to win the 200, he beats Blake and Weir makes it a Jamaican trifecta, 19.32, it's the time that Johnson ran to win in Atlanta in 1996, 200 outside his Olympic record and 1300 outside his world record, but Bolt first, Blake second, Weir third, Jamaica first, Jamaica second, Jamaica third. I came here one him, one goal, and that's to become a legend, and you're looking at him right now. <laughs> a living legend. For me, Jesse Owens, Michael Johnson, these are the guys I admire, and I wanted to be like, and I've really stepped, stepped it up now, and I'm inside, I'm one of them, so I'm happy. Right now, I'm just extremely happy that I've really pulled it off. I've came out here, showed all the odds. I've had a lot of people doubt me, say a lot of things, but I've shown the world that no matter what you say, I'm the best. I've come to Australia for holidays. I'm going to try to see some sights, have some fun, party, do all kinds of different stuff, but no work. All holidays. That's what you're just about to do, isn't it, David? No work. What? Holiday. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's a few things around the house I might be asked to do. No, I don't think so. It's, um, yeah, he, he was funny because that was the time, Jim, you may remember after the, uh, the, uh, the Olympics in London, they were talking about Johan Blake, who apparently is a very handy fast bowler. Mm. And, and Usain Bolt said, well, if Johan comes out and plays in the T20, I'll come out and play in the T20. That's right. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what started a lot of that discussion about them coming to Australia. It's good enough for Andrew Johns. It's good enough for Usain Bolt. <laughs> remember? Yeah. <laughs> I, reckon, I, reckon, I reckon Bolt might be... He, he might let it go from, from a fair height at a fair bit of speed. <laughs> The only trouble Bolt would have would be overstepping the mark. He's got such a long stride. <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be dangerous. And, uh, and Blake, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, they were, uh, that, was an, that was incredible, that 200. I thought, you know, 50 metres to go. I said, don't tell me Blake's going to beat him. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he just stretched out and away he went again. But uh, it's, uh, it's some athlete, isn't it, to win three gold medals, sprint gold medals, in successive games, and I think there were what world records, the three world, world records in the three in in um, uh, Beijing, and I'm just trying to think, did they break the world record for the relay in London? I don't think they did, mm. but uh, still, he's uh, he's set a benchmark, and he's still keen to to try and do the same thing in in, uh, in Rio, and the way he's going, <laughs> he might do it. Another text, yeah, Jim coming through from Al saying, Karen, I'm not sure if David will remember this, but a few years ago 
we were at the St George Roosters Anzac Day clash. St George scored two late tries to steal the game. <laughs> My friends and I were so excited, mm. we started jumping up and down, which happened to be right in front of the ABC commentary box. Even Warren Ryan was cheering after the last try, but David remained composed the whole time. What makes this even more remarkable is that David is a St George supporter, something I didn't know at the time. Here's to mm. a true professional, an icon of Australian sports broadcasting. All the best, mate, and hope to see you at a Dragons game soon. That's from Al. The remarkable thing about that day, Karen, is that uh, the Roosters kicked the penalty goal with about five or six minutes to go, and a lot of the St George Illawarra supporters in front of our broadcast box left, and all of a sudden they scored a try. Uh, Mick Wayman, I think, scored the try, and some of the St George supporters who were leaving decided to come back in. And one fellow came back in and he was so excited. I, I don't know how he didn't break his leg, his arm or anything else, but he fell over the chairs. He went, I'm not sure how many chairs and rows of chairs he fell over as he came racing back in and mm. Ben Cray scores the winning try next to the uprights. <coughs> and uh, it was... <laughs> It's, and it was, again, as uh, McGillray told us a long, long time ago, Jim, <laughs> yes. never over till it's over. Don't leave a sporting event till it's finished. Yeah, well. And that goes back to Mac, of course, missing the side <laughs> test finish. Yeah, that, that's, that was the lesson of that experience. <laughs> never assume anything in sport. Things can go wrong. But, uh, yes. Yeah, well, you never did that. Oh, I never leave early. Not in a football game. I've <laughs> never been known to leave a sporting event early. Well, ever. You've never not... left an event early. You, like well, last night, we were you. the golf riders yes. in there. We were the last to leave. Were we? Oh, you're giving we away were. tales. <laughs> uh, Clint, Clint from Tweed Heads says, My Sunday afternoons will never be the same. Uh, Sean from Bomaderry in New South Wales says, Thanks for the memories, David Morrow. And uh, look, just there's so much on Twitter as well, but just a couple from the North Queensland Cowboys, their official account is saying best wishes to David Morrow, mm. who is finishing up a distinguished career with at ABC Grandstand today. From the Traugan Tiger, congratulations to David Morrow for many great calls over this year. The years, this AFL follower enjoyed his fabulous quotes on the ABC. And uh, from at Richard Newsom saying, there's some great reminiscing right now with David Morrow on ABC Grandstand. So sad to see him retire. Uh, it's not just the Australians that you've brought us, brought us David. We've heard Usain Bolt. Uh, but athletics is so global and we just see the cream of the crop at the Olympic Games. And I think to be that, that home games and in London, to see the double of Mo Farah uh, and the way that you were able to call him home. And I've just got the 10,000 metres here and mm. it was one of my favourites and I just want to bring it to everyone. On the inside, it's Mo Farah. Machiri of Kenya is currently in second position. Behind these is Taraku Beckley. And Rupp behind those. Then Kenanisa Beckley. He's trying to get on. He's trying to go with them to see whether he can win a third gold medal. Down the back, though. Mo Farah leads. Machiri of Kenya is second. The Beckley brothers at the moment, third and fifth, separating them as Rupp as they go down the back with 200 to go. Mo Farah in front. It's Taraku Beckley running second. Machiri of Kenya is next. Rupp is starting to surge around the outside the American and Kennedy Sebegley has he got a final sprint around the turn Mo Farah in front Tarek Du Beckley is the danger behind these Rupp and Kennedy Sebegley but Mo Farah stretching out Mo Farah in front Mo Farah coming down to the line and Great Britain win another gold medal Mo Farah goes through Rupp second Tarek Du Beckley has gone through and in the end it's Beckley third Beckley fourth but Mo Farah congratulates Rupp it's Great Britain Britain first, United States second. Unbelievable as Mo Farah wins Great Britain's third gold medal in half an hour here in the Olympic Stadium. And David, the last lap, 53.48 seconds. I don't think I've ever seen a 10,000 metre race quite like that. The Ethiopians and the Kenyans beaten by a runner from Great Britain and the United States as Ben St. Lawrence finishes his Olympic campaign in the 10K. What an unbelievable finish to an incredible tactical race. The Eritreans tried to take them on. The Kenyans tried to take them on. The Ethiopians thought they'd put one of the Beckley brothers in position to win. And in the end, Mo Farah and Galen Ruck, having to run their own race without any help at all, have taken the Quinella 1-2. Oh, don't think it gets much better than that. With 
And David, just to bring you some more from, from so many messages that are coming through and thank you to everyone who's who's been contributing. From Matt Ryan on Facebook, Mr Morrow, you've been one of the voices of my life. Long drives home on a Sunday afternoon. I'm sure you kept Dad awake as you do me now, living in Japan when it's 38 degrees and 98% humidity outside. Only one man's voice can bring the temperature down as he describes the frozen ground of Brookie or a chilly breeze at Leichhardt. No one, absolutely no one, can call a try in the corner like you did. Mm. And from Anne, also coming through on Facebook, thanks, David. As a country girl from far north Queensland but a resident of Sydney for 30 years, I truly enjoyed listening to the stories you and Warren told when commentating on Rugby League. You have a true gift for storytelling and I think I found you sharing your passion and knowledge of the game before a match even more fun than the actual match. I always preferred to listen to your radio commentary, except for State of Origin, where the whole family would want to watch the TV coverage. At these times, I always kept my radio close by so I could hear your reactions to any controversies that occurred during the match. All the very best for the future, and I hope you are not lost to the airways for long. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Can I go on? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, was just, I was just thinking that Mo Farah and I, it was... Uh, yeah. You know, it was just extraordinary to be in that stadium that night. Um, when at home, I mean, you know, you've been at these sort of events, Jim. When, you, when you're in a stadium like that and the home athlete or the home performer is winning, there's just, you know, there's something about it. And to see this fella just take them all on, and that was a night when we we thought the Kenyans, the Ethiopians, the Eritreans might try some team running to try and take the gas out of uh, both Rupp and... Uh, and Mo Farah, and uh, in the end, it was uh, that they just stood tall. It was an amazing performance from them, and to be there because Rutherford had won the long jump from memory, and I'm just trying to think the other gold medal they'd won inside the, that night. It was, uh, it was it's amazing how you, you lose track of uh, things that happened on that night. It was just it was it was a fabulous night. It really was, and Mo Farah, of course, then he came back and won the 5k. But that night, you're right, Karen. It was uh, that that set the standard for the London Olympics athletics program. We talked about all the M's, and we've got two of my favourite M's sitting there at the golf in Maxwell and uh, Morrow. But, you know, we, we played a little earlier today when, you know, of all people, David Morrow had to be able to, you know, touch the Melbourne Cup, like within half an hour of it being won uh, oh, uh, this year at Flemington. Here's just a, a little bit more from uh, the Spring Racing Carnival, including that other M, Drew Morfitt. And the prize money takes him past a million dollars. Well, tell me why he didn't back Terra Vista all up that with that, that sort of strike rate. Mr. Statistician's come out with all the stats. After the event. <laughs> After the event. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's easy to be wise. I, I had to get the Sunday newspaper. I reckon I'll get Sunday's newspaper one Saturday once in my life, and the headline will be, Rain Throughout Australia Cancels All Race Meetings. <laughs> <laughs> David, sensational. Thank you, mate. We're soon to lose David to uh, ABC Grandstand. It's just been a pleasure for me to stand with him in the mounting yard over the last 10 years or something. Uh, his knowledge of the game is fantastic. His knowledge of the people involved in the game is unbelievable, and we'll miss him here, G. Oh, I use his binoculars, so I couldn't do this if it wasn't for David, who's been <laughs> a great guide to me over a decade, and those binoculars that were used as a course broadcaster in Sydney, they still kick around here uh, in my position and I'm absolutely indebted to you David for uh, for the start and the guidance that you've given me along the way. I've got good news for you. Oh, you won't get rid of me. I'll be here I'll be here at Carnival time next year, but I'll only see you at the end of the day and just see whether you can keep up then. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Um, the carnival is not over. No. Um, I didn't want to get too emotional, but um, I, I said earlier this week, because there's a lot of changes happening in, in a lot of areas, but, you know, I think we've been reminded, haven't we, with the passing of Philip Hughes about the importance of family, of being connected and of what's important in life. And I, I truly feel very privileged to be part 
of the Grandstand family. And Jim won't remember this, but when I first joined, and I'm not a commentator, but, you know, I saw Jim and I felt very nervous about going up to say hello to him. He was visiting TV Sport at the time because... He was someone that I listened to all the time and I couldn't believe, a bit like you were talking, David, when you first met Norman May, uh, Alan McGilvray, all of that. There have been some very, very special names and, and both of you and, and David, as we say goodbye to you today from Grandstand, you're just right up there and I just want to say thank you and it's been very, very special to have been included in the same Grandstand family as you. Uh, thank you, Karen, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, special thanks to my wife and, and daughters because they haven't had a father or a, a husband at home on weekends for about, what, 35 years? And, uh, and I've got to, to say thank you to one person in particular, Alan Marks, mm. because without Marksy, I might never have done anything. So thanks, mate, and we'll have a beer tomorrow to celebrate. And thanks, mate. Thanks, Jim, for all your help. And David, fantastic. Wonderful to be with you and to hear your piercing voice call sport with so much passion. We'll get there. We'll have a bit of a... We'll have a we might go and have a beer. What do you reckon? It's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good idea. It's raining out, so we've probably got some work to do before we go, though. That's the trouble. <laughs> but thanks, Karen. It's been uh, been an absolute pleasure, and uh, it's been a wonderful ride. And, uh, you know, another part of my life starts, but I'll uh, I'll enjoy it. Thanks, David.